Matt Adams, yeah. So I'm sorry Matt can't be here to, to speak, um, but I'm here in his stead. So I'm one of three artists in, in a group called Blast Theory. Uh, and we uh, are Matt Adams, Duro Farr, and me, Mick Tandavanich. Uh, and we've been making interactive art for the last 30 years that really looks at social and political questions and tries to get our audience to think about those questions within our work. Um, 30 years is a long time and a lot has changed. So I thought I'd quickly recap. Uh, uh, so 30 years ago, we were all in our 20s. Uh, we we're all living in London. Uh, we we're all involved uh, in different degrees in uh, the rave scene. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, in the 1980s, uh, Britain was uh, led by Margaret Thatcher and a conservative government. And at the time, there was a very antagonistic relationship between youth culture and government. And that was one of the sort of prompting, uh, instigating factors in us forming as a, an artist group. The other was thinking about uh, contemporary theatre practice at the time. Uh, so we were a, a real mix of different kind of practices. I studied um, cultural theory uh, and fine art. Um, Jew studied fine art and textiles. And Matt studied English. And so we had a very varied take on what we wanted to make. But we, what we did have was uh, a shared interest in going out. Uh, a shared interest in films and a kind of cultural consumption and music, uh, and also an interest to try and reinvigorate uh, the kind of work that we could make or the kind of theatre we could make. And at that time, we'd think about it in terms of theatre, but the reality of what actually happened was that we tended to make things that were more like evenings out. So we would make events that were structured around uh, DJs and music with choreography and performance artists and sculptors, all contributing small fragments of work. People would be free to wander, to drink, to socialise, to chat, to reflect, uh, uh, and, and to engage with whatever was going on in the space. And we were working with found spaces throughout London uh, and around the UK later. Um, this is actually a photograph from one of our first shows. Of, uh, it's called Gunman Kill 3. Uh, and it was a project that really tried to interrogate what our relationship is to violence, in particular gun violence, in the UK. And we were taught, and at the time, Northern Ireland and the conflict in Northern Ireland was strongly in the news. And we really wanted to see what, how we could address the kind of representations of violence in the news. Um, so in this part of the evening, um, we actually stopped the whole show and asked everyone in the audience if anyone had fired a gun. Uh, and most people hadn't. And then we would ask, does anyone want to fire a gun? Um, and most there'd be someone who put their hand up. And so we would then set the stage for two performers to walk back and forth about, uh, this is about uh, 10 metres away from uh, a piece of police tape, and we would invite a mem that audience member to shoot uh, a paintball gun at uh, one of our performers. Uh, and we would describe to them uh, the, the size of the bruise that would be left, because the performers would be wearing um, nothing apart from underwear, uh, and we would give them the choice as to whether they wanted to go ahead or not. Uh, and then we would continue the show, and in every case, someone would at least have a go at firing the gun. So now, sort of 30 years later, <coughs> we make participatory uh, performance that normally integrates technology in some way, so work that takes place out in the city or I I in, in specific locations. We make interactive film projects uh, for cinemas and for mobile phones, and we also make work for museums and galleries. Um, but we often work in, in partnership with research labs, so one of the main partners we have is a research lab called the Mixed Reality Lab at the University of Nottingham. Um, so how do, we, how do we think about our work? So I kind of wanted to sort of structure this around kind of what are kind of guiding principles as to why we make work, and then use some examples of the work that we've actually made to talk about the kind of the three some some ideas about what we have in mind when we're making work. Um, so, as the title of the the talk suggests, we always consider our work as unfinished until it's in the hands of our audience. Um, so this sort of feeds into the kind of process that we have. So, we we tend to make our work in a number of stages where we iterate with audiences doing trials or paper tests, or works in progress and scratch tests. And in each of those situations, we find fe we get feedback from our audiences to what their experience is. Um, 
we also like to think of our work not as stories. You know, there's a sort of thing, you know, you, get, you go to Sundance and everyone goes, it's all about the story. And we're not, we use stories, but I don't, I'd say we're not particularly interested in stories. We're not here to tell our, our worldview to people. We're here to create structures and frameworks to prompt conversations. And we want to create a space where you do the thinking as opposed to us trying to uh, tell our story. We're also particularly interested in the city as a site for um, play, uh, but also as a site which is, I guess, the engine and a sort of generator for society and sort of social behaviour. Uh, we also, uh, I would su suggest, although we use technology a lot in our work, we are sceptics. So, for example, the most recent round of VR and XR, we would s say that we stand to one side of that and we actively inspect that with some degree of scepticism uh, as to where that's going and what's it, what its intents are. <coughs> um, but so we also have uh, a challenge that we set ourselves in our work, which is around uh, the voice of the work. And as I say, um, we're not really here to tell our own stories. You know, uh, we're, we're kind of interested in like making spaces where other people can speak as, as participants in the work. Um, so how does it, what does this mean in practice? So there's kind of three kind of principles that I kind of wanted to introduce. <coughs> and in the course of talking about them, hopefully I'll, I'll share something a bit more uh, tangible about what we actually make. Um, oh, sorry, that's the wrong way around. So the first is the audience as protagonist. So this, is, this kind of really came from one particular project that we made back in 1998 where we had been doing research into uh, a, a trial called the Spanner Trial, which was um, a trial where a group of homosexual men were being um, prosecuted for participating in a sadomasochistic party. Uh, and we found it intriguing that you could consent to having your body harmed uh, and yet still be prosecuted for, for, for that consent. Uh, and so we wanted to make a, a piece of work that really interrogated giving up control and what pleasures we actually find in being out of control and losing control. And so uh, for a long time, we tried to, up to this point, we'd been making work in black box theatre studios, you know, com composing things around what's going to happen in this corner of the room and what's going to happen in this corner of the room and then what's the next thing that happens, you know. Very participatory and the audience moves around, but very much with a sense of the space is the room and the time frame is the time you arrive and it ends when you leave. Um, instead, when we came to work on this project, we had a kind of, I suppose, an epiphany or a moment of revelation where instead of thinking about the space of the work being a room, we thought about it as a journey for someone who takes part in the experience. So starting with their first contact with the, with the project, leading all the way through to like, the, the, the end of the work. And so the structure of our giving out uh, giving up control work was that it would be a lottery and so you could buy a ticket for the lottery and if you won the lottery on a specified date we would kidnap you and we would hold you in a room for two days uh, and then we would release you and that was all that would happen but in the course of doing that um, we would uh, stream the, the event so that you peop other people could see what that experience was and also have the conversation as to why you would want to do this and what would be interesting about it and so it was the first project that were took place online um, that we made. So we had a website where the 24 or the 48 hours of captivity were streamed. But we also thought about space, as I say, not in terms of the room, but of the kinds of spaces that we could inhabit in people's imaginations. From, uh, and so we made a 30 second advert, which appeared in the advert reels nationwide in cinemas. So people could see an advert advertising this service where you could win the prize of being kidnapped. Uh, and we uh, recruited uh, a PR company to release stories through the national press. And we realised that the space of this work was the space of the electronic space of the media that we would be working with and the imaginations of the people who read about this, the story. Um, and it crystallised for us one day uh, w during, the, during the kidnap where someone rang us on the free phone line that we'd set up to say... Uh, we can. I know that you're out there. You're not going to get me. I can see you waiting in the van to come and get me. Uh, and then they hung up. Uh, and it was someone who was. We had no idea who they were. And we were definitely not in a van outside their house. But yet, on the day of the kidnap, they were sitting at home, just getting ready for this experience. And 
it made us realize that there was a, a new kind of work where the reach of the work wasn't contained by the walls of the space. It was contained about the reach that we could make using technology or using means to kind of contact people. Um, so this sort of sense of the audience as protagonist mat has matured into a whole series of works where we invite people to go on journeys through the city. <coughs> and, and these normally fit a more traditional theatrical frame where you would buy a ticket, you would be given a location to go to at a certain time, you would receive a phone call, um, and then you would be led on a journey through the city. Um, and that might take any number of forms. This is a project called Ulrika Name and Compliant that we did at the Venice Biennale in 2009. Um, and it was uh, our take on the war on terror and really trying to sort of address what the time was kind of quite a sort of acerbic kind of, or a very sh from our point of view, a very short-sighted sense of uh, the, the what terrorism was. We wanted to recall uh, uh, historic forms of terrorism, so uh, we took two historic figures, or, or Rika Meinhof from the Red Army faction, uh, and Eamon Collins, who was a member of the uh, Irish Republican Army, and, and took their lives and invited you to walk through their lives and make choices as to whether you would just um, make this, make, make, ask you if you would make the same choices as they did. Uh, and at the end, you're interviewed about what that experience was. So there's a little bit of a, our video just to give you a flavour of this. Hello, Eamon. I'll stay on the line while you walk. Keep your eyes open. Act natural. There's always a first time for this kind of thing, and practice makes it easier. I'm going to count to ten. If you're still on the line when I get to ten, then I'll know where you stand. One. The two killers ride into Warren Point on a motorbike. Two. They switch the engine off, allowing the bike to glide the last 20 metres so as not to raise the alarm. 3. Once inside, Iceman goes down the corridor into Toombs' office. 4. He takes up a firing position with arms outstretched. 5. His gun jams, giving Toombs enough time to reach for his own weapon. 6. Iceman leaps onto him and the two men struggle. Seven, the second gunman comes running down the hall and shouts, stand back. Eight, Iceman lets go and the second man fires several shots into tombs. Nine, Iceman clears his weapon. 10, he pumps several more rounds into tombs as he lies dying. So at the end of your walk, you're led to uh, uh, an interview room uh, and one of our performers then begins a, a conversation that begins with the question, what would you fight for? Uh, and it's completely open-ended and it's up to you whether you answer as the fictional person that you've been invited to put yourself in the shoes of, or the, the, the historic person, not fictional person, or as yourself. And so some people will answer in the, in the, in the voice of Eamon Collins or of Ulrike Meinhof, having just spent the preceding 30 minutes walking through their life, or they'll talk about their own experience. And for us, there's, a, there's, something, interest, uh, there's something interesting about creating an uncertainty about where you might lay or where you might identify yourself within that space. So, uh, so the second... Um, idea that we kind of tend to use is one which comes from one of our collaborators, the Mixed Reality Lab, it is a term, uh, Mixed Reality. So um, it, it was really coined uh, in the 1990s in the context of the kind of first sort of wave of VR that kind of preceded uh, the kind of the current, the current round of kind of VR-based experiences. Uh, and at the time, the definition as, as it was written is a blend of physical and virtual worlds that includes both real and computer-generated objects, where a user can navigate the environment and interact with both real and virtual objects. Um, so this is an example of our work from the time. This, this is a project called Can You See Me Now? And we toured this to about 20 cities, and we actually won uh, an award, the Prios Electronica, for this one. Um, and it's a mixed reality chase, uh, where we have a group of people online who log into a website, 
they explore a virtual city centre, but that city centre is a real city centre where there are, are performers actually on the real streets. They have mobile devices and they can track the locations of online players in the city. When you log in, you're invited to give the name of someone you um, haven't seen for a long time but you still think of, so someone who is absent. While you're being chased, while you walk around the city, you find that the people who are on the streets are actually there to chase you, and so it's a hunt. They, they run after you, uh, and, and, and at a certain point, depending on how dexterous you are evading them, uh, they'll eventually catch you, and at that point, they'll take a photo of the empty street corner where you would have been standing had you been there for real, and that photo is then posted online, and it's named with the person that you haven't seen for a long time. So it's a, a kind of memorial to this empty spot where you've had a moment of memory, uh, and it's, uh, it's a record of that, that point in time. Um, it was quite novel. Uh, as you can see, there's a bunch of kit that this performer is wearing at the time in 2001, and all of that would now be an iPhone, presumably. Uh, but these things, these things move on. Um, but one of the things that really um, we took from this sort of notion of mixed reality is less to do, well, is not entirely around the particular sort of technologies. It's, it's more to do with the difference or the, bound, the, the shifting boundary between physical and sort of digital space. Um, and the kind of questions that, that these technologies can pose for us in terms of um, how we use them. So where are the spaces that we now find privacy? Where are the spaces where we actually find intimacy or safety? Um, and how is the technology that we use changing the shape of those spaces and the boundaries for those spaces? And those are the questions that uh, uh, really intrigue us when we kind of think of mixed reality. So uh, the second project, so this uh, 14 years later is a project called Karen, which you can still get in the App Store. It's an interactive drama. And uh, at the time, we had been doing uh, some research around uh, the Tesco's database. So Tesco's is a, um, a supermarket chain in the UK, uh, and they they professed that their, their economic model was based entirely on the um, knowledge that they had about their customer database and their shopping habits, which made them a cut above every other supermarket chain in the UK. And so this was an archetypal application of big data. Um, but as we dug deeper, it was also the time of uh, the Cambridge Analytica scandal. So we actually test road tested some of Cambridge Analytica's um, platforms in Facebook for this project. Um, uh, when we dug deeper, we found that it isn't just shopping habits that people are paying attention to. It's actually your personality that people are att paying attention to and your behavioral profile. So what is that prompts you to act in any particular way? Because that's the thing that can make people money. And so we wanted to find a way to actually uh, engage with this as a sort of, it's a very sort of tricky and amorphous thing to sort of try and think about. So we created this project, which is uh, a project called Karen, and she's a life coach. Uh, she appears on your phone in a series of FaceTime calls where she tries to coach you to improve your life. But things go awry over the course of your sessions with Karen, uh, and you might find that uh, where you end up is a little unexpected. But when you get to the end, you'll then see uh, a data report which we created with a data scientist that talks about all the psychometric profiling that was used within the course of you interacting with Karen and the, the, the things that the she thinks she now knows about you or that other people would claim to know about you having uh, asked you these questions. So, uh, yeah, as I say, it's available in the App Store. Um, but mixed reality sort of up to date we kind of think about in 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 uh, lots of in 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 as I say in a in a sort of in a very sort of broad broader sense, not really to do with technology or thinking about how we can use technology um, to layer different kinds of experiences. And, and um, this is a project called Spitz Press Death, which we produced in 2019, just before the pandemic, which was uh, to commemorate the death of 20,000 people in Philadelphia during the flu pandemic of 1918-19. Um, and um, in Philadelphia, which was one of the worst hit cities in the US in the flu pandemic, uh, there was a, a movement to halt a, a parade which took place in 1918. Um, uh, and it was it, the parade was a fundraising parade for the First World War. 
uh, and the heads of uh, the medical associations in the city advised against it going ahead because it would be a, a potentially super spreading event, which it, it did in turn out to be. In turn, turn out to be, and so we wanted to create a parade to commemorate the people who died in the wake of the original parade. Um, and so this was the project we created. So, and it mixed a whole different range of, of a whole different set of different ways of participating. So we had an engagement program where we reached out to local communities along the route of the parade. We had uh, um, access to the historic records for the 20,000 people who died, and we actually assisted with the digitization of those records and the cleaning up of the data, and turned that into a mobile website where people were able to browse through each of the records of someone who died and choose someone that they wanted to commemorate. So by registering for the parade, they would then have chosen someone. And when they arrived, we would give them a printout of the death certificate. Um, and um, at the same time, we, we recorded a, uh, a choral score that accompanied the parade, and that was actually played through people's mobile phones. So while you're walking, you could use your phone to make this kind of synchronized multi-voice choral piece. Again, so I've got uh, a little clip of video which gives a bit more of a flavour. Protect yourself from infection. Jacob J. Crimrell. Robert Pierce, Ruth Anna Barr, Martin Reynolds, Keep well and don't get hysterical. Norman Brow. So um, the, uh, the phrases that you hear sung are actually from a public information pamphlet that was produced in 1918. So there's all sorts of kind of crazy things like keep well and don't get hysterical. That's, uh, yeah. Um, and so over the course of the parades, th each parader has an opportunity to stand uh, alone in the centre of the parade, and they're passed by two light sculptures that run past them. Um, and their name is then called out. Um, so I think I, I've, I've actually raced through my talk, so there might be time for questions. I know that we're not supposed to have questions at the end, but uh, there probably will be time. Uh, so the, the last thing uh, I want to... Sorry. The last thing I wanted to talk about is um, presence. So, in a way, this is kind of this comes a lot from. Uh, this relates a lot to the the kinds of questions around subjectivity that came up from the the work of the Venice Biennale about all recurring name and compliant. Um, the is for us is a kind of question of what do you bring to the piece of work if 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 we're in the business of making a piece of work where you are one of our co-creators, you are the person who finishes the work, how do, we, how do we facilitate you to actually contribute to the work in some way? You know, what is, what is our job if, if we're going to leave it down to you? Um, and I think the, w the way I would sort of summarise it is, is or one of the ways I would summarise it is around presence and about how we create a sense that we are all here in this room together. You know, how do we how do we recognise that? You know, how do we recognise each other as individuals when we're actually in a space, or when we're communicating over a telephone, or when we're watching each other's videos on on a social media application? How do we understand who that person is? Like, what what is the presence they have? What is the significance? You know, what would we attribute to their life? Uh, and um, for us, it's it's uh, I guess. Know, the, the, when we, the, one of the questions that we have when we are testing our, our work is, is, um, is um, 
what, what are people doing? Which sounds like a really stupid question. You know, what are you doing? Like, you know, are you, are you walking down the street? Are you, I don't know, answering, choosing, answering a multiple choice question on an app? Or, or like, you know, there's some things that are very sort of, you know, y y you can answer it kind of rudimentally, but the real question for us is like, uh, like, what are you bringing of yourself? How would you give, how would you give an account of what you're doing? Like, would you say you were being honest? Would you say you were being playful? You know, would you say that you were just listening to a story or you're a spectator? Um, and I think that's that's the the kind of question when we make work is that like for for, for every when when we say it's unfinished, we are it's not just that having someone in the, need, we need someone in the room just to watch. It's it's that we actually need that person to to give something of themselves to actually make this worth doing in the first place, you know. Um, and so, uh, so the project I kind of wanted to talk about in relation to this was a project called My One Demand. Uh, so this was a, a feature film, um, which uh, about unrequitedness, uh, which streamed live uh, to uh, Toronto International Film Festival Cinema uh, and online. Um, and it was constructed as a single shot. So uh, it starts um, in downtown Toronto, and it starts outside a hospital. And you see a mother bringing her, I think, three-month-old child out of the hospital. Uh, and then it follows her to meet uh, a, a young girl who then cycles further and meets a, a, a friend. And it follows a daisy chain of, of, of seven people on a journey that takes about seven kilometers across Toronto in a single Steadicam shot. So we're kind of moving between our, our Steadicam operator sort of running backwards uh, to being on the back of a little rickshaw that's with an electric bike to in the back of a pickup truck. But anyway, it was fun. Uh, um, and at the same time, as you watch the feature film, um, at four points in the film, you're asked a question. Uh, um, and um, what we try to do is, is really try to connect um, connect people's personal experience, like emotional experience of unrequitedness, the sense of like you you're putting in and you're not getting back, and connect that with uh, um, the feelings that of political powerlessness or sense of powerfulness that we have and the, the kind of system that we live in. And how do these two things inter interrelate? The sort of sense that you, you know, you, I'm sure you've, you've been in relationships where you feel like you're the one doing all the work. And then how does that relate to when you think about, well, trying to change things in society and you think, well, what impact can I have on, on, on society at large and how powerful or powerless am I? And so we wanted to try and connect these two sensations. We felt they were kind of in interrelated. We don't know how. And, and so the structure of this film was that we interviewed each of the, the seven people who uh, took part. Uh, they're all professional actors, but we asked them to talk about their own political history, about their own personal relationships. And those became the voices and the stories within the film. But those were prompts for you to, uh, to answer questions um, yourself. So in the cinema, you, you're actively encouraged to get your phone out and there was a, a, a web app that you could, the question would appear and it would ask you to answer the question in, in the web app. Uh, and the final question, so the, the film is about 90 minutes long and the final question is, uh, and now I'm going to forget what the final question is. So, uh, oh God. <laughs> uh, it is, um, is there something that you, you wished you could change but can't. Uh, and so over the, over the course of the whole film, you know, you have a cinema full of people who are just sort of sitting and occasionally they'll get their phone out, they'll answer the question. Um, yeah. And um, this final question, uh, the, over the seven people, the, it progresses to... Uh, uh, the, the, each of the people gets older and older. And they're linked in, this, in the fictional world by uh, having all attended uh, the Occupy movement in Toronto um, and having met each other there. But that, that bit we made up. Um, but in answer to the, the final question, so when the, the final credits roll, just before the main credits for the film, is everyone's answer that they gave about um, something that they could 
wish they could change but couldn't. And so it's a list of several hundred things. It takes about five minutes of the film. It's just watching this list scroll up before the credits appear. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's, I think one of the things that was striking for us was how the cinema was completely silent and everyone sat and just read these several hundred things that appeared on the screen. And yeah, I think judging by the answers that people gave, it felt that people were being honest and sincere and very heartfelt. And it was a moment where, yeah, I think one of the things that we try and do is um, find ways for people to speak in new ways. And that is partly a formal thing, you know, who, who gets to hear the innermost thoughts of the person sat next to them in a cinema? No one. And, and that's one of the things that we thought we'd managed to do. And before everyone left, everyone sort of stood up. And you have that moment where the lights come up in the cinema. You look at a room full of people and you go, who are all these strangers whose innermost thoughts I've just heard? And that was the moment that we wanted to create. And so I guess presence. Presence. So I'm just going to show the trailer from that. And that's the end of my talk. So... Tonight, I want you to meet some people who changed my life without even knowing it. I spoke to them all one day, nearly four years ago. to arrive in the park and some said he was there before the protests even began but there's no doubt he was one of the last to leave I thought I thought yes they're right yes we must yes this is outrageous I don't spend my precious time doing anything for the greater good. Yeah, I do some things for the good in my immediate circle. I try to be a good mother, a good daughter, a good friend. I try not to do harm. But I'm aware that there are many people in the world who are active and spend their precious Time making a bigger world better. People who speak out. And I don't. And I'm musing on that now. Now that I'm finally off the treadmill because I have a little money in the bank. Because it shames me. It kind of shames me how little I know politically and how how little I do politically. The fact of the matter is that I don't know a lot and I don't do a lot. I feel a lot. Are you starting to hate me now? probably isn't time for questions, but if anyone wants to talk to me afterwards, I'll be around. So. Uh.